So it's, a wonderful, so it's a wonderful pleasure to host this evening an exceptional event, a lecture recital with Sarah Kay, professor at the Department of uh, French Literature, Thought and Culture, who will present her next book, Medieval Song from Aristotle to Opera, and Christopher Preston Thompson, voice and medieval harp, and artistic director of the website associated with this uh, forthcoming book. Sarah is the author of numerous and very original books on medieval Occitan and French literature, uh, including Subjectivity in Troubadour Poetry, in, uh, published in 1990, uh, Parrots and Nightingales, uh, <coughs> Troubadour Quotations and the Development in, of Euron, European Poetry, published in 2013, and Animal Skins and the Reading Self in 2017. Her thoughts and analysis have revolutionized medieval studies, and she's directly involved in contemporary philosophy on animality and sound studies. Christopher is a New, is a new York City-based tenor, a historical harpist and musicologist focused on early and new music. He has performed as a soloist in venues throughout, throughout uh, the United States, including in New York City's Carnegie Hall and Merkin Hall and has served as music consultant, composer, arranger, and uh, coach for several companies. Recent publications and recordings include Pizza, Opera, and Hybridity, <laughs> and recording musical games, riddles, and puzzles of the Renaissance with Pomerium. Misa to S. Petrus with the Chamber Choir of St. Luke in the Fields. So, welcome, and uh, it's time for your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you to everyone for coming, and thank you for those of you who are joining us uh, by Zoom. So in Medieval Song from Aristotle to Opera, I suggest new ways of listening to Medieval Song. It's common to begin by exploring its putative social context, considering, for example, the way of life of medieval courts, or the performance modes associated with urban settings, or the historical circumstances, of particular patrons and audiences. I begin instead by trying to gauge how any given song positions and characterizes the singing voice or voices that produce it and the sound world it inhabits, supposes or generates. Although some of these songs no doubt reference particular social settings, I find they also posit very different ecologies and very different scales, ranging from the immense expanse of the cosmos to the privacy of the individual imagination. As they associate themselves with these varying environments, songs communicate with senses other than hearing. In particular, they are partly relayed through sight, whether that of the manuscript page that transmits them or the spectacle that performance conjures. They can also convey a strong impression of singing as corporeal involvement underlining the dependence of voice on breath and the difficulty for the singer of consistently sustaining that breath. In this talk, I want to convey something of the vertiginous variations in ecology and scale that result from the voice plunging from the sphere of the fixed stars to the intimacy of the singer's body and its imaginings. The book proceeds by often densely philological close readings, in which I propose understanding individual words or expressions differently from earlier editors or readers. But a public talk is no place for such intricacies, and tonight I instead I'm going to venture a form of son et lumière, where my talk will be supplemented by the lumière of images and the son produced by Christopher Preston Thompson, vocalist and harpist, who's collaborated with me on this project, as uh, Francois uh, has described. My first image, which you'll know from the poster, is this lovely painting by another collaborator, Benjamin Thorpe. It's a modern recasting of the traditional astronomical planisphere, a way of representing the heavens from a position somewhere above the stars from which the eye looks down on the celestial globe flattened outward like a plate. 
Thorpe's modern planisphere puts particular emphasis on luminosity and voice and was created to accompany a performance of an alba or dawn song that begins literally as a song sung by the changing skies at dawn. From earliest times, this dawning of celestial light has been associated with enlightenment and can take on the quality of an epiphany in the sense of the sudden revelation to a mortal of something unearthly or otherworldly. Such revelations typically involve radiant light and the sound of a voice, often the singing voice. The Consolation of Philosophy, a Latin philosophical dialogue by the 6th century philosophy, philosopher Boethius, opens with such an epiphany. As the philosophy reveals herself to him, the first person narrator of their encounter. The Boethius figure is sunk deep in misery, but when philosophy reaches out to touch him, he responds to her touch in a Latin song that voices his dawning recognition of the enlightenment that philosophy brings. The song's word figure that light as the sun in contrast to the shadows it dispels. In these verses, which are the first song on the handout, which I think everybody has access to, including people who are joining us electronically, the same word lumen, light, is used to refer both to the illumination that comes from outside, from the sun, and to the prisoner's eyes that receive it. In the opening verses, Boethius's eyes recover their former strength. In its closing ones, the sun is identified as the god Phoebus Apollo, whose light is alert and vibrant, the latter implying sonority as well as liveliness, in a way appropriate to a god who is also the patron of song. The repetition of lumen makes light seem not just active, but interactive and communicative between sky and earth and between gods and men. The song leaps up in the prisoner as the inner light of reason quickens within him, takes up the singing of the light source that illumines him and is invigorated by it. The song was originally written without music, but in the early Middle Ages, the verses in Boethius' Consolation were set to music. We decided to perform this piece differently from the previous recording that exists of it, which is solemn, and if I may say so, rather portentous, in order to capture the drama of a voice enlivened by light. These 
lines are sung with the voice of transcendent, transforming light. Elsewhere, singing more clearly relies on breath. But what is breath? One possible answer is that it is air. Another, that it is spirit. Between these answers lie vast ecological differences, taking ecology very basically as the relations between beings, their space and their time. One feature that remains constant, however, is that breathing, in any sense, involves a dynamic of exchange between inside and outside via a breach of the body's boundary that is the very condition of the body's survival. At stake is not just coexistence, but interpenetration, which provides the material basis for the many kinds of hybridity we find in these songs. Pre-modern cosmology agrees with modern science in confining the air to the zone around the Earth below the moon. It does not extend up as far as the stars. Air in this sense is one of the four elements which make up the terrestrial world. And its association with terrestrial life is widespread in medieval song. For most troubadours indeed, breath, singing and the other experiences to which singing claims to relate are located in what some modern ecologists call the critical zone, a kind of terrestrial epidermis that extends from the deepest roots of trees to their highest foliage. Within this zone, all manner of interactions take place between different species, plants, insects, birds, animals, including humans, and the different terrestrial elements, fire and water, earth itself, and of course the air, in a vast network of what Bruno Latour calls actants. Because songs are intended to be sung, not just their content, but also their form is structured by this environment. The rhythm of meter and rhyme, melodic contours and melismas are measured in and by the singer's breath, to which they serve as an acoustic double, amplifying and elaborating it for aesthetic effect. Indeed, many songs are called airs or arias, short-circuiting between medium and art form. Air in movement as wind or breeze, or warming or cooling as the seasons change, frequently figures in the opening stanzas of medieval lyrics, thereby introducing songs under the sign of the element that enables and shapes them. Soon we will hear singing in which breath relates specifically to this zone. But in pre-modern cosmology, the transparent substance through which the higher spheres move is identified as an additional fifth element, or quintessence, known in some traditions of thought by the Greek term pneuma, Latin spiritus, whose core meaning, breath, also includes spirit or soul. The basic insight behind this term is that breath, life and spirit are at once all connected and all pervasive. Because notions such as life and spirit have material as well as non-material significance, because although spiritual is sometimes opposed to material, it is by no means necessarily so. The potential ramifications of conceptions of pneuma are vast, uh, as attested in influential medical writings, such as Avicenna's Canon of Medicine, where breath is not merely respiration, but vitality and soul, as well as in multiple strains of antique natural philosophy. Such spirit forms part of an ecology that extends far beyond the critical zone or the sublunary realm of the air to the spheres within which celestial bodies move and even to the divine. When we encounter songs to, about or on behalf of celestial light, as we do in numerous late antique works with the same mixed prose and verse form as Boethius's Consolation. They sometimes explicitly evoke this celestial breath. One of the commonly cited signs of dawn is the stars gradually fading in the sky. Space and time were both, as they still are, organised in relation to the constellations, those great beasts of the sky, the bear with its link to the North Star, and the creatures of the zodiac. Astronomers' representations of these beasts were widely known through their association with calendars. 
the beasts that prevail in different seasons are like living beings on earth, but their celestial existence means their breath was associated with winds and weather, like the dog star or frosty Capricorn. A number of these beasts overlap with those found on medieval maps. In fact, cosmological maps look like maps to indicate exotic continents and with those in the familiar genre of the bestiary, a moralized anthology of animals described both in their physical natures and as bearers of divine meaning. In a number of cases, this meaning is particularly associated with their breath, like the lion whose cub is born dead and who restores it to life with his quasi-divine breath. When medieval songs evoke the breath of these beasts, what kind of voice do they imply? One that comes from the stars, from a remote land, or from a bestiary lion, image of the resurrection. In the second song we present tonight, we locate the voice to which the troubadour Rigaud de Berbazil aspires, as sustained by a pneuma that extends from the most distant reaches of the universe to the wildest, most far-flung lands of the earth and beyond to God or to the gods, since the reviving breath for which the troubadour longs comes not from the Christian God in this song, but from Amor. The song's melody confirms its distance from the critical zone. It has a liturgical ring to it as if the breath which inspires it came from an astral or divine pneuma rather than from the terrestrial air. And yet the lion is still a beast. And while Christopher Preston Thompson maintains this reverential quality in his a cappella performance, he also contributes in the opening stanza a feral edge to the longed for heavenly roar. As hope, as hope for this intervention fades, the performance records the singer's sense of his breath faltering between song and sob and his own spirit eventually expiring. Atresi cum loleos cestan fers consirais de sone leone cont nais morts ses alene ses vida Lo fai
is at the same time a wild beast, an animating force, a spiritual truth, and the inspiration of lyric song, is also found in a narrative poem, the Dit du Lion, by the 14th century poet and composer Guillaume de Machaut. Entry to an island garden is policed by the lion of the title. And as the poet finds his way there in a dreamlike state, we understand that the garden is an Arcadia of love and poetry, or of love poetry, from which many are excluded. Led by the lion to meet the garden's queen, Machaut imagines it singing to her a chanteur. Chanteur, literally sing, weep, appears here as the name of a lyric genre. Elsewhere, it can designate a mechanical contraption a kind of watering device. As in the song by the troubadour we just heard, a lion's voice and breath are heard in a lover's appeal. Exotic and imaginable, sublime, but also faintly comic, this voice expresses the impossibilities of love and song. The Didu Lyon does not actually contain any songs, but we found an anonymous chanteur pleur that is close in date to Masha's text and that equally expresses the quest for an unattainable song. As far as we know, this song has never been performed in modern times before. But in his performance notes, which will be included on the website, Christopher comments how similar it is to sing to a much better song, a, be a much better known song, excuse me, by Macho, the long lament or complaint in another of his narrative works, The Remède de Fortune. Since both offer, and this is a quotation, a structure, from Christopher, a structure around which to shape a rhapsodic, partly sung, partly cried, partly declaimed expression of animated pneuma. Whereas the complaint is sung by the first person lover and narrator, however, the chanteur is imagined as being sung by a lion, guardian of courtly qualities in an idealized garden and yet confined within the inarticulacy of a beast.
Many medieval songs are located in a much more recognisable landscape, in a voice sustained by the air rather than a remote spirit. But the voice that sings them is still hybridised by its other actants, to use Latour's word again. The singer's voice is like that of various birds, and the breath that sustains, that sustains it comes from the same air as the breeze ruffling the leaves of the trees. Like the pneuma descending from the stars, this breath also animates the vital functions of animate life, including human life. By means of breath, air enables the organism to function and keeps alive the mysterious life force or soul that humans share with other living beings. Pre-modern physiology recognizes voice as just a byproduct of these essential life-sustaining activities. A song whose coherence derives from these ideas is Bernard de Ventadon's Canobos Gages es Floritz. Bernard was one of the most successful of the mid 12th century troubadours, so much so that he's often taken for their most representative poet. At the beginning of this song, the singer's performance is aligned with the voices of songbirds in the mating season, as if de deliberately positing his voice as animal. But whereas the birds' voices are uninhibited in their courtship, the troubadour's breathing, and hence his singing, are shaken by involuntary sighs that constrict his heart. The role played by breath in regulating body temperature is disturbed, and the lover falls prey to alternating chills and fevers. The tongue, another component of voice, appears as a waggling mechanism that easily gets out of control and has to be violently restrained. We're constantly reminded that voice is a byproduct of other more important biological systems. At the end of the song, the singer, overwhelmed by despair and frustration, faces the extinction of that same life force, the animal soul, by which his voice and his love have so far been, although haltingly, sustained.
que la pensa tira. De tal dolor me fai casmar, car tan sas mi sot me escondi. It's unlikely that this song has been heard before in public because it's, as Christopher knows, transmitted in only one manuscript and without any accompanying music. Um, so this song, as is true of several of the songs that are analyzed with the book, um, because they're not transmitted with any music, present an interesting challenge in terms of performance approach. With no extant musical notation, it seemed we had a handful of viable options for performing and recording the pieces for the website. Uh, the first was to declaim the text without specific melody in a heightened spoken recitation, something akin to a dramatic monologue with no fixed musical, musical component. And of course, as someone who loves singing melodies, this was not the most appealing option, though it certainly would have sufficed. Um, the second option was to improvise a melody without fixing its musical form beyond the structure provided by the poetic meter and to leave musical decisions to in-the-moment inspiration. Uh, while creatively appealing, this option seemed to leave too much room for inconsistency and didn't hold up to the detailed analytical style of the rest of the book's content. The third option was to compose a new melody to go with the text, but better yet seems to be to choose an extant contemporary medieval melody and create a new contrafact, the product of which you just heard. Taking this approach allowed us not only to stick more closely to primary source material, but also gave us the opportunity to make meaningful intertextual connections between the poems at hand. Bernardo Ventidorn's Canna Boscages as Floritz, which you just heard, of course, begins in conventional fashion, as Sarah has pointed out, calling on natural imagery to evoke intense feelings of true love. However, the lyric A of Kamnabos Gages quickly spins into a roller coaster of swirling emotions out of which he never emerges. Uh, as Sarah says in, in the book, much of the song is about the physiology of voice, and by extension, airflow and animation of the soul. The lyric A complains of endless sighing. His disrupted breathing disturbs the regulation of his body temperature resulting in alternating chills and warmth. His foolishly wagging tongue makes him want to violently strike down his teeth in order, strike his own teeth in order to silence his tongue. Uh, his clamoring heart leads to an inarticulateness, etc. Another of Bernard's songs, En Cum Tirer Es En Es Mai, provided a well-suited host melody, both in terms of musical poetic structure and textual content. While Kamla Boscages tells the story of a scorned lover who talks too much and whose love is not nourished by the lady, En Consirer, Es en Esmai, seems, when read consecutively, to perceive the former as an interlocutor for Bernard engaged to confess his love for the lady, as if En Consirer were the opening of a love story doomed to fail. In En Consirer, Bernard's tongue is paralyzed and he cannot sing his songs to the lady to tell her of his love for fear of rejection. After many stanzas of internal debate and self-deprecation, he decides to put his words into a letter to her, which, if left unreciprocated, would kill him. When interpreted in combination with Conlo Boscages, unrequited love does, in fact, lead him to death, at least poetically. 
and he spends the entirety of the second song faltering between vocalized physiological manifestations of the appetitive soul and inarticulate coher incoherence. It is as if the two songs are bookends of the Lyric Age love story, one beginning with a sense of hope that spirals into destruction. The melody of En Concierer, the, the host song, uh, provides a perfectly suitable uh, melody for the text of Carmel Boscages, as no alterations are required in order to fit the text to the music. Uh, this performance, and even more so the recording that will appear on the book's accompanying website, experiments with the balance between rational song and incoherent vocalizations through declamation, variations in overall pacing and textual dynamic shaping, rhetorical gesture amplified by a heavily improvisational accompaniment, and a dramatic interpretation that dissolves into broken isolation. <clears throat> so as Christopher just explained, we had to imagine this performance. And for Bernard too, it is imaginary. The song records his feelings, painful as they are, but does not present itself as performing them to an audience. In stanza eight, he imagines its reception as a communion of the impressions recorded by the senses through the operations of the vital spirits or animal soul. Through this exchange, he and his lady will achieve perfect understanding of one another and be as one. This all-important performance is pure fantasy, however, given his lady's frosty behavior towards him. It's staged in an imaginary inner theater where the lover's song will be understood without his needing even to sing it. This imaginary theater of medieval song gives it an operatic quality. I don't mean that medieval song texts resemble subsequent opera, though in some ways they do. My point is rather that song forms part of a spectacle which is, as, which is as or more likely to be staged in the imagination as in actuality. This imaginary staging is visible in manuscript il illuminations. I'm sorry about the way that my um, heading for this slide has been written over by the signs of the Zoom. A singer on horseback on the left, the scroll represents his song as part of a scene staged in the reader's imagination, is what it says. So the, the singer is the, the figure on the far left on the hillside. Uh, in the Dit du Lion, the narrator looks at the lion and imagines it singing. We look at the page and imagine it too. The other songs we have so far heard, even though they do not reference imagination, project an imaginary scene of performance. The protagonist in Boethius's dialogue is lost in misery, touched by philosophy, and suddenly illumined by the spotlight of her presence. The singer of the lion song aspires to sing with the voice of a lion that would come to him if only love and his lady would bring him back to life. The song we hear is just a shadow of the one he can imagine singing. Tonight's final song explicitly addresses this quality of imaginary spectacle. Its opening line, for this I praise God and St. Andrew, suggests it was intended to be sung to a St. Andrew's Day hymn tune. So again, this is a first, uh, sorry, um, like the last piece, it has no surviving music. So we went, on, we went on the hunt for a St. Andrew's Day hymn tune to sing it to, and we found one. Uh, <coughs> As you'll hear, it would be hard to find less wor words less appropriate to a hymn. The poet responsible, a troubadour known only as Markabru, goes from boasting his superior judgment to bragging he can outsmart his neighbors to mock promoting his poetic expertise. Regarding his neighbors, he claims to have unhindered access to their sexual partners while securely guarding his own. These claims, couched in metaphors of eating, fighting, hunting, and land ownership, between them evoke physical appetite, violence, animality, and domination. The whole text is wildly offensive. The root cause of this obnoxiousness, I think, is that the poet, who often elsewhere laments the limitations of reason, here takes the bolder step of positioning his voice outside reason altogether in the thick of impressions and imaginings. 
Adopting a voice grounded in the senses and imagination, the song directs audience and readers to respond to it with theirs too. This is clearest in stanza six, which uses terms to do with hitting or striking that recall medieval definitions of sound and meter. The rhythm described in its opening lines, two short blows with a cudgel or stick and one long thrust of a blade, captures the sequence of two short lines and one longer one that defines their meter. The mimicry of form by content continues in the next three lines with the singer's rapid jab and parry, followed by a successful lunge. The same rhythm passes from the language of touch to that of sight and sound in the next following stanza, as two small hands rush forward baying and the third larger one strains back before attacking. This configuration is almost certainly a metaphor for sale male sex organs. It animalizes and sexualizes not only the banging and thrusting of the previous stanza, but also the verse form. Similarly, on the level of imagined sound, the noise of blows raining down is transposed into canine yelping. We hear the song's meter as a series of blows and animal cries. Although nowhere notated for singing, the song notates the experience of hearing it or imagining hearing it sung. Much of it is taken up with a parade of sense perceptions, each presented in its own little imaginary vignette, beginning with taste and smell, then touch, hearing and sight, uh, with the fighting and the hunting dogs, and concluding with colour in stanza nine, in which the singer boasts that he is pregnant with innumerable signs. And signs is the word that's used in the Latin Aristotle to translate impression in the psychological sense or in, that, in, that, in the sense of what, what impresses itself on the mind. So he's pregnant with innumerable signs or impressions in the midst of a conflagration that he himself has ignited by bringing fire here even if he alternately douses it with water there. It's from this blazing warehouse of sensation and impression that he draws the colours of his song in a rich assembly of patterned sensations. Not only is the song furnished with the contents of the troubadour's imagination, it also represents how the imagination works to produce them. Bout the Africa's perfect. 
Boethius of Sunlight, and we end with Mulcabrew's Dark Imaginings, not in order to deny historical songs a home in historical courts, cities, or churches, but also by arguing for their belonging in such different kinds of space to lift them out of history. The voices that sing these songs and the breath that sustains those voices belong in a series of interlocking environments, cosmological, biological, and phantasmatic. These occupy drastically divergent scales that belong in the non-human temporalities of the fixed stars, or the beasts, or of faltering respiratory organs, or the riot of imagined sensations. They both crowd it with sensation and place it out of earshot, impress it on the reader and evade intelligibility. We hope we have made it possible for you to relish some of those qualities this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, uh, for this wonderful show, this wonderful recital and lecture. And it's time for questions. Uh, perhaps could you say something about uh, this website, the presentation? When, when will it be available? And but would you say something uh, about it? Sure. Well, the website um, that is the companion to Medieval Song from Aristotle to Opera, Sarah's book, um, will come out at, its, I think, exactly the same time as the book does. Uh, which, are we allowed to say? Well, uh, yeah, you know, publication doesn't happen all on one day these days. It happens in dribs and drabs, and it's supposed to start, they, I think they turn the, the faucet on around July next year. Okay. Right. And okay. so, on the website will be about three hours of recorded music. Okay. That's not just me, because that would be awfully long winded. Um, <laughs> it also um, is members of the medieval ensemble that I direct, Concordia and Dawn. So there are five other musicians in total throughout the website. Uh, and it's a, a mixture of singers, uh, a viol player, a recorder player, and me playing harp and singing, of course. Um, and Along with the recordings, there will also be a performance reflection narrative to go along with each chapter. And there will also be uh, editions of manuscript transcriptions that I did as we were putting these pieces together. So all of the new contrafacts will be on there, all of the transcriptions of extant melodies will be there. 
uh, and I transcribed all of the Masho polyphonic stuff we did. There's a Vitri motet on there as well, which is a four voice thing. It's all um, new transcriptions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and also there's text, complete texts and translations, which meant, made writing the book a lot easier because I could quote very selectively from the pieces, knowing that the complete texts and translations were also available. Um, I mean, the, 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 the repertoire you've heard this evening um, was consequent partly on the, on the fact that we didn't have the time to bring, to pull together a, 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 an ensemble of, of, of voices. So we had to sing only mon a monophonic pieces. Mm -hmm. But there are several pieces that are arranged for more than one, that are sung by more than one voice, and then quite a number of complex pieces of polyphony, right? Yes. Yeah. I have a, well, so, let's... Uh, Sarah, um, I think I understand uh, what you mean when you talk about lifting... Could you use the, the... I'm sorry. I, I think I understand what you mean when you talk about lifting the songs out of history, and I'm not so much opposed to it as you might think, but <laughs> all, the, all the same, um, couldn't one say that, th that history um, that, that this, you, you also put the songs very firmly within a historical context, namely the one in which this cosmology makes sense. So would, would you be just as happy saying, instead of lifting it out of history, that you put it into history on a different scale? Um, or or with, with, um, with, with, in a broader kind of way? I mean, are you... Do you have some stake in the formula of lifting mm -hmm. them out of history that would, would keep you from the, using the, the terms I just did? Uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, so, no, I mean, that wasn't meant to be, you know, um, a, a, provo a provocation. Um, in fact, in the broader context of the book, what it is, is a, an attempt to contribute to the wider debate in sound studies about the problem of access to what is lost through time. And, you know, it's one of the um, cliches of anyone who writes on past sound that it's gone. And then Lo and behold, the researchers say, oh, it's gone, but mm, I think I may have found a little bit of it. And, uh, and so there's a constant effort at retrieval. And it, it seemed to me that one of the ways to, one of the ways to try to get un, underneath that question was to relax the notion of time somewhat. So as to Precisely, you, you, I think your, your expression is, very, is, is a very good one, to have different scales of, of the passage of time. Um, because, if, because if something is taking place in imaginary time, or if it's taking place in the time of the galaxies, it's not, it's not confined within the same human history that people are referring to when they say the sounds of the time of the sounds of the past are lost. That's that's what that's essentially what that what, what that little fragment of my conclusion what it was was about. Jerry's, it's a question of um, whether or not you're suggesting that our contemporary notions of, of breathing and the porosity between atmosphere and the, the breath within and the kind of circulation are part of something that you're seeding ecology in medieval times in a different way. And then I was wondering, um, was this unlike something you had to breathe before? Was it, did it involve a different practice for you, or was it an extension of the kind of training you already had? 
I would, I would say it's an extension of the training that I've had, because of course as singers we talk about breath all the time, and breath management. It's such an important part of singing. But we tend to think of it on a sort of technical, practical level, and not as much on an enlivening of the spirit level. However, um, you know, anyone who does anything theatrically in an opera setting, a spoken theater setting, anything like that, of course the breath and the way that the breath is taken in is always engaged with as a, a <coughs> sort of catapult into the next unit. And so I think what's really interesting about this project for me was recontextualizing the way I think about the breath that I take and how it animates my, my spirit to move on to the next unit so that it, it, it took it away from a, a, a very practical way of thinking about it and much more of a spiritual way of thinking about it and a philosophical way. And so I would say it definitely it's a, a, an important <coughs> extension of the training that I've had. So my question is about the elongation of the syllables in the singing, which was wonderful, really wonderful. But um, it's something I don't quite understand how you know how to do that. Because <laughs> when one, one learns how to sing in French, of course, one learns how to do the Urmue. It, there's a, it's one of the first things that you learn that helps a lot, actually, with pronouncing French correctly. But this, this was something entirely different. And um, so I'd like to know a little bit about how you worked on that. Oh, well, you know, that, that's part and parcel with rhythm, of course, and rhythm in performance of medieval song is a huge, it's a huge can of worms that um, I don't necessarily think we should go into, but uh, my approach to, to these pieces is to, as much as I can, um, give the natural ebb and flow of the text as much priority in combination with the natural ebb and flow of the musical line. Uh, so when I elongate a syllable, most often I hope it's because it's, it would be a lengthened syllable in a word grouping. And so it emphasizes, I hope, it emphasizes um, the natural um, sentence structure and its ebb and flow. Uh, and the, the ebb and flow of the melodic line influences that as well. So there are certainly times when the way a note falls in a melodic line dictates how long I hold it. But I, it's always fun for me as I learn these pieces to track in the, in the subsequent stanzas if I do the same thing with that note or not. And almost always there's variety from stanza to stanza. In, in this, in the third line of stanza one, the highest note might be elongated because it's musically natural and textually natural. But then, in the same line in the next stanza, that might be on a conjunction and it's not an important note. And so I move through that high note onto the next one. And don't write that. There is a, a difference though, isn't there, in the way the music is actually they're transmitted, whereby I mean, some of the lengthening of syllables is marked in the musical notation when, when you get what are called melismas, you know, singing a whole series of different pitches on the same syllable. Uh, and I mean, what, what, one of the things that was is so interesting working with, um, working with the detail of these songs is the, I mean, it's, it's well known, I think, that, the, that in early medieval poetry, where the main form of ornament is rhyme, the, those melismas nearly always fall on the rhyme words. Right? Um, but in later medieval poetry, in the poetry of Mashal, the melismas can fall in the most baffling places, especially in the polyphonic pieces. And you get endlessly ornamented conjunctions, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And... Um, and you're left absolutely struggling for the meaning of the text when it actually is drowned out by, 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 by flows of sound that are always pulling you away from it. 
So it is very different for the for the different uh, sections of the repertoire that we worked on. Yeah, and the, you know, the music of Machel was in such a, a, a rhythmically exploratory and um, time where you know, so much notational innovation was happening that I think <laughs> the rest got put on the back burner a little bit for <laughs> this exciting rhythmic innovation that was happening. And in, in the songs that you heard this evening, um, all of them, save for one, were transmitted in the manuscript without rhythmic indications in any substantial way. But on aimé et en confort, that is from the manuscript, the Chansonnier Pangé, which does have some kind of <laughs> practically uncodable um, rhythmic notation. And so the way I chose to perform it, it's, it's, a, it's a notation that's referred to as pre-Franconian and Franco in the 13th century sort of codified some rhythmic rules and the way that notes were drawn. And so anyway, this manuscript exhibits some of that, but it's not exact. And so the way I chose to form this interpretation was to transcribe it as if it were as much as possible abiding by Franconian notation rules, and um, then use that as a structure that didn't necessarily rigidly adhere to the rhythms, but um, shaped a rhapsodic, a flexible, arioso style, um, uh, rhythmic uh, pacing around that structure. So I use it as a shaping more than it's something rigid. Question from outside. From the room. Oh, right. um, so, Sarah, I know it's, it's hard to do counterfactual history, but I'm just curious to know if you feel that you would have written a different book if you had not collaborated with Christopher during this process. And not only in terms of the content mm -hmm. of the book, which is quite obvious, but mostly in terms of I don't know, your way of writing, mm -hmm. your style, the mm -hmm. way in which you structured the book. Mm -hmm. And um, has this collaboration, and to which extent this collaboration has actually changed your practice of scholarship or your style of scholarship? That's, a, that's such an interesting question. And yeah, I mean, the truth is that I didn't have the idea of working in, with the, on the practical dimension of song until I had half written the book. So I had three chapters written and they were already being looked at by presses when we went out to lunch and talked about, you know, what we might do. And one of the first things we said, oh, we could do lecture recitals. <laughs> and, um, uh, 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 and so actually I have quite an exact measure of that because I then had to go back and rewrite those chapters. Um, uh, and uh, yes, it meant engaging much more conscientiously than I had previously been doing with what, with how I would understand the sound and, the sound and placement of the voice. Yes. And so that was very interesting. And I, I mean, I hope that it's been emerged from this, that this has really been a two-way street. For example, there were there are two beasts lyrics that I talk about, one involving the lion that Christopher sang this evening, and one involving a panther. When I first wrote about them, I wrote about them in very similar terms, but then you performed them so differently from one another, and the breath of the panther came across as such a different value in the song. It was enticing and it was seductive. You know, it wasn't a feral roar, the purpose of which was to rouse, you know, set the world on, you know, make the, make the world sit up and take notice and make it lazy and is lazy and love, you know, deliver the goods. It was instead a much more seductive, wasn't it? And uh, so that was an experience where I actually rewrote the commentary on the song as a result of the collaboration. Okay, um, the, the online audience is going wild. Um, 
Uh, we'll squeeze as many of these in as we can. Uh, first is from Kathleen. Thank you, Sarah, for a fascinating talk and Christopher for beautiful singing. Latour considers the modern conception of the Anthropocene as a, a large part an aesthetic problem, a quote, crisis of imagination. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on medieval music as a relevant method to study the modern Anthropocene. Number one, to what extent can study of medieval songs help us perceive the Anthropocene in a more concrete way? In other words, number two, how can the study of medieval songs help us make use of our five senses to develop a better sensitivity to the non-human natural world? Oh, well, thank you, Catherine. Um, uh, I, I, I can't answer such an ambitious program uh, of, you know, uh, of, of work. Um, I, I didn't think I would be able to, to take on with just with the kinds of things that I do, the, 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 the problems of the modern Anthropocene. Um, but I, I, I have found it very salutary to move the sort of base of the kind of core of my thinking away from the kind of the, 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 the classical uh, tropes of medieval historical research, which are courts, courtliness, urban society, churches, etc., to move them away from that and into questions that that engage that 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 engage the, our relationship to quote unquote nature. Um, such as, I mean, there's a you know, I was pervasively interested by medicine uh, and as well as by as as well as by cosmology, and. I, I I don't want to offer myself as a model for the kind of work that other people should do at, at all, but I I the I I think it does reposition this kind of this kind this kind of corpus of work very significantly to to approach it in this way, whether or not it makes a difference to our climate crisis today. Okay. Um, next one is from Eliza. Eliza has a question about Markabru's song in relation to Aristotle's famous passage on semiotics. In seeing your brilliant analysis of Markabru's song, I was reminded of Aristotle's discussion of inferring smoke from a fire, see Markabru's fire, and the presence of an animal from its tracks Marco Bruce Hounds. Mm -hmm. That passage on semiotics also talks about how when we hear the voice, we attend to the emotion it expresses. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to make of the resemblances, but what would it mean to think about Marco Bruce's song and the voice in terms of a theory of uh, semiotics? Oh, again, I mean, that's just far too brilliant a question uh, to, to, to be able that's that really to answer. I mean, I'm scrambling to think, uh, to, to pull my, my thoughts together. Uh, I, I, I think it's possible that, that Mokabru is not sympathetic to Aristotle, right? That's, I mean, that seems to me that uh, he uses he uses elements of Aristotelian philosophy, psychology. She actually corrected herself later on. She says, sorry, Augustine, not Aristotle. Ah, uh, now you're talking. <laughs> yes, um, uh, th that makes a lot more sense because I think that taking the position of imagination against reason is a position that for Markaburu is not a tenable position. Uh, and uh, the kind of um, the kind of inferential, um, the kind of the the, the, the the chain of signification that that that, that Eliza is talking about there makes a, a huge amount of sense. Yes. Uh, your talk suggests. Sorry, this is Johannes. Uh, your talk suggests that breath circulates at various scales, from the cosmos to individual songs, and yet breath also seems to follow very select paths 
including specific animals and expert poet composers. <laughs> How do you understand the relation between a seemingly all-encompassing universal breath and specific poetic realizations? <sighs> They're not easy, are they? They're coming in from, this is Johannes. I'm letting you off the hook. This is Johannes <laughs> in Stanford. Hello, Johannes in Stanford. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, uh, it's true that I've been very selective in what I've spoken about, and I, I, I have, in fact, been particularly interested by song always at the moment of its failure, right? Uh, I mean, song that can, can only be performed in imagination, song that is too impeded in its performance to be properly heard. Um, uh, and all of, the, all of the creatures around the world that are successfully breathing <laughs> and getting on with it without any problems, I'm afraid I haven't. I haven't given them too much, of, too much thought. <laughs> Because it, it it was so interesting to to me to try to chart the collision between a failing a failing biological system and an aspiring artistic system, and um, uh, yes, I mean obviously there would be a great deal, <laughs> a great deal more, and there, there would have been plenty of songs to sing that don't stage anything like the sense of crisis, right, that, that you, 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 know, you, you nobly produced song after song this evening. Yeah, it's a very fun adventure in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Francie Scanlon would like to know on a completely different quote-unquote note, is there any improvisation akin to jazz? That's for you. Oh wow! Well, you know, I often, I often consider going to take some jazz improvisation lessons to help my medieval harp playing, because I, I, I came at I came at accompanying songs on harp by way of singing them. I wanted to accompany myself. I saw a colleague do it once, and I fell in love with it. So I just I started to do it. And the most frightening thing about it was the improvisational component. Um, and so, is there anything akin to jazz in accompanying these songs? Uh, absolutely, I think so. The harmonic language isn't necessarily the same. You could even say that some of this might be pre-harmonic language, I don't know. But in any case, absolutely. I, uh, yeah. I, in fact, I think you reminded me, I need to contact somebody about that. It's been on my list. <laughs> People might be interested to hear a little bit about your harp, which is just one of your harps. Yeah, this is one of my, three medieval harps. This is a 13-stringed, um, just a little chant harp. It's got a drum string at the bottom, and then a, a scale on the 12 strings above that. And so it's very good for songs that you can sing over a drone. A drone would be just one sustained note that goes on and on and on while you sing the melody over it. Uh, it, I would say this is on the, I mean, for 11th through 14th century harps, this is not a, um, I would say this is a medium to small size. My biggest one, uh, my biggest medieval harp has 26 strings, and that would be kind of like the deluxe version <laughs> of the late Middle Ages. Um, and then I have one in between that has 19 strings on it. It's also quite small. I like this one a lot um, because it can, you know, do a lot of. I can do a lot of patterning on it. You heard me do that a lot in the in the piece, sort of back and forth. And so it gives this wash of tonality, but it um, it doesn't confine me to a, a, this idea of I've got to do chord progressions, I've got to do this or that, because that's all I'm not really on the table with this repertoire. So. One of the, the members of your ensemble, 
the, the viol player, Nico, uh, Nico Seligman, is also a contemporary composer and has released uh, at least one al album, if not more, right, of, of his uh, own... Yeah, at least one. Of his, own, of his own compositions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so he's someone who is working between contemporary composition and medieval improvisation. And it's, it's not jazz, but in answer to the question, it, it's, it's nevertheless kind of related, it seems to me. Yeah, he's like, I love working with him because he, he, he started as a musician in medieval and folk music. And uh, so this, this repertoire, is, it, it feels like it's in his DNA because he's been doing it his, his whole life. And so when he improvises an accompaniment, it's just so fun to sing it. And when he's improvising his, his own compositions, it likewise is strikingly great. Imp extraordinary, yeah. Okay, last question for the road is, thank you for a very informative and detailed lecture, and thanks to Christopher for the beautiful renditions. Professor Kay, what motivated you to write a book? <laughs> well, you know, I've always written books as if my life depended on it. Um, so, you know, uh, I guess when I stop, but that will be it. Never oh, <laughs> stop. Well, I mean, I, it, uh, ever since I discovered at, at about the age of 40 in my first job that I, as a medievalist, I, I wasn't condemned to doing editions and writing articles and I could write books instead. I've never stopped. <clears throat> it, was a, it was an illumination. <laughs> okay. No, no, no other questions. So it was a real challenge to speak about breath, breathing with this mask. <laughs> so thank you so much, especially you, Christopher, for Absolutely. accepting thank to, you so to sing with this horrible things. <laughs> yeah. So once again, thank you, thank you all. This is really a wonderful, a wonderful show. We sit our rector. Uh, thank you.